So now let me go ahead and talk about some stuff that isn't talked about in every uh, introductory economics course, and that's the idea of quantity controls. So instead of intervening to change the market price, the government might intervene to change the market quantity. And just like we had two different versions of price controls, price ceilings and price floors, we have two different versions of quantity controls. We can have quantity controls on buying and quantity controls on selling. And those are actually going to be fairly different out there. So often these permits are going to be resold, and unless I say otherwise, I'm going to assume that. Let me first think about quantity limits on selling. So if we have quantity limits on selling, then people are only allowed to sell as much of the good as they have a permit for. Um, so an example that economists love is the fact that to drive a taxi cab in New York City, you have to have what's called a taxi cab medallion. And there's a fixed number of these in circulation, and basically the city of New York doesn't issue new ones. So the total number of taxi cabs in New York is pretty much fixed. Likewise, in many communities, if you want to sell hard liquor, you need to have a liquor license. And if you want to go ahead and enter the business of selling hard liquor, typically you have to buy out an existing uh, owner of a liquor license. Sometimes you can get a new one issued, but that's very tricky and not always done. So what happens if we have a quantity limit on selling? Well, the supply curve looks normal until we get to that limit of the amount that people are allowed to sell. And then basically, despite any further increases in the price, that would shall not sell more than the quantity limit. So whereas the, the real supply curve based on seller costs would go ahead and keep on going out this way, the new effective supply curve turns straight up vertical right at this quantity limit. So we can go ahead and think about the effects on consumer and producer surplus, just like we did with our price controls. As before, if our old equilibrium price is here, originally consumer surplus is everything above the old equilibrium price and below the demand curve. So originally consumer surplus is A plus B plus C. Originally producer surplus is everything below that price and above the supply curve. So originally producer surplus is D plus E plus F. Now there is a new equilibrium price. So the, the only amount supplied is up to here and the place where the supply curve intersects the demand curve is right here. So that's our equilibrium. And notice where a price floor to help out, per, help out sellers or producers creates this issue of shortages. We actually don't, sorry, surpluses. Here we don't have a surplus. We've artificially restricted supply. And then that restriction in supply forces up the market price of its own accord. But in terms of the effects on consumer and producer welfare, it's going to be very similar. So in particular here, of course, these transactions that would have been mutually beneficial trades no longer happen. And so these gains from trades C and E no longer happen. So that's our dead weight loss. And B is the area that is redistributed from consumers because B used to be part of consumer surplus and now it's below the price and above the supply curve. So now B is part of producer surplus. So overall the same amount of redistribution but we don't create this problem of shortages, sorry, surpluses like we did with our price floor. This slide lays out everything that I pretty much said. The one addition here is how do we figure out what the licenses are worth. Well, the people who are most willing to pay for the licenses are going to be these people with low seller costs, because these are the people who can make the most profit by selling at that equilibrium price. And essentially what's going to happen here is the person who's right here, this marginal seller, has seller costs here, and they would be able to 
provide the good and get paid a price of this equilibrium price. So this distance here between the marginal seller's cost and the equilibrium price is how much profit they would be able to get if they held a license. And so that's the maximum amount that they would be willing to pay for a license. So if a liquor license allows people to bring in $200,000 worth a year of profits, then liquor licenses are going to sell for an equivalent amount there. So several times that because, of course, it's a long-term investment. So let's look on the other side. We can look and see what would happen if we placed a limit on buying. In this case, people have to hold a permit to be legally allowed to buy, or there's some kind of restriction on how many units people are allowed to buy. And the prime example here would be something like ration coupons. So often when a country is having shortages, it issues ration coupons and it says, okay, people are only going to be allowed to buy a certain number of pounds of bread or meat or something like that. And essentially what happens here is, whereas in the case of a quantity limit on selling, the government is acting as a cartel on behalf of the sellers, artificially restricting supply and pushing prices up, rationing essentially works as the government acting as a cartel, intervening on behalf of the buyers. And I think that's very non-obvious to people, that rationing is essentially the government artificially restricting demand for the sake of the buyers in an attempt to make the buyers better off. Because otherwise, the very high level of demand is going to push up prices. So, whereas sort of the real demand curve based upon people's fundamental willingness to pay would keep on going out here, the fact that we're going to limit the amount that people can demand to be right here means that the demand curve turns due south at that limit and we get a new equilibrium market price down here where the effective demand curve intersects the supply curve. Stuff that you've all heard before, but one more time, of course, certain transactions, these transactions between the quantity limit and the original equilibrium quantity, these transactions no longer happen. So the gains from trade that would have been created by those transactions no longer occur, and we have this deadweight loss C and E. There's a redistribution element here as well. So by pushing down the price or keeping the price from rising, the rationing redistributes economic welfare from sellers to buyers. And D, this area D here, is the amount of economic welfare that is redistributed from the sellers to the buyers. How much is the ration coupon going to be worth? Well, the marginal buyer values the good this much up here, and the ration coupon allows them to actually buy the good for this price. So being able to buy something for this lower price that's that much lower than your willingness to pay, the ration coupons are going to be worth this distance here between the marginal buyer's willingness to pay and the new market price. And this slide essentially runs through all of those calculations. Things to notice about all this. Earlier I stated that economists are pretty hostile to price controls because they're a very inefficient way of redistributing economic welfare. And you can see here that even quantity controls, which are pretty blunt, are going to allow us to achieve the same kind of redistribution as price controls, but they're more efficiently doing it. Or put another way, number two here, price controls are a less efficient method of redistribution than quantity controls, because price controls create these problems with shortages and surplus, and people waste a lot of time standing in line and that kind of stuff. And so we can go ahead and achieve the same kind of redistribution through quantity controls that we could through price controls. There are actually going to be even more efficient ways to redistribute economic welfare than quantity controls, and we'll get to those later. But essentially you can see that we always want to be looking 
for the best way to achieve any given policy objective. And that's one of the reasons why economists are really pretty skeptical of price controls. A last point here to notice is that both of these types of controls, price controls and quantity controls, ultimately lead transactions to fall because transactions are the lesser of the amount that people want to buy and the amount that people want to sell. So if we wanted to go ahead and suppress some sort of market, we could establish a price ceiling. So if someone was really interested in, in sort of fiendish, they could establish a price ceiling on something like ammunition or guns and therefore make it unprofitable to supply those goods and therefore um, lower the amount of transactions there. Likewise, we could think about decreasing the amount that people want to smoke by, or the amount that people are able to smoke, by establishing some sort of price ceiling on cigarettes and making it unprofitable to supply them. Or we could establish a price floor on cigarettes. We could go ahead and say, you know, we're really pro-tobacco farmer and we want to make sure that they get a fair price, so let's establish a minimum price for tobacco. But in doing so, we would actually reduce the amount um, that happens in that industry. All right, we'll go ahead and leave it there, and that will be price and quantity controls.